Hey, it's Victor Devon, and you're listening to Weaver Less, the podcast. Thank you to the Patreon supporters Alex, Amy, Andrea, Bo, Dahl, Drew, Kelly, Princess Chris, Rob, Rocco, Ruthless Retribution, and Stormageddon. Your support means the world to me. Thank you so much. This is Victor Devon, and you're listening to Weberless, the podcast. I am uh, in Riverside, California, and I am on a Zoom call with one of uh, the most, in, in my estimation, one of the most important figures in neo burlesque production in uh, a great number of years. They celebrated 10 years producing the same show at the Wow Cafe Theater, and they were one of the very first people to give me a New York City gig. So they will always have a very special place in my heart. I've done several shows with them uh, on their turf and too few on my own. So I'm glad to welcome to the airwaves, uh, Jay-Z Bitch. Hello, hello. Hi, Victor. It's good <laughs> to hear from you. It's and, really great. Uh, it's been so long. Yeah, I know. And now we're so far away. <laughs> I know. But we're so far, but we're so close. But we're um, here, but we're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I'm actually, I'm glad that I had a chance to invite you to the show uh, when you were just coming to New York. Yeah. And um, I remember you actually coming highly recommended and people are like, oh, you have to have this amazing person. Um, so yeah, it all worked out. Yeah, no, and, and I didn't know, um, I was so Going to anyone who has never been to the Wow Cafe Theater, it's it, it's in the center of, of of the street in this big. I guess is is it is it an apartment building with it's with business? It's a multi. It's the, it's a multi purpose building. Um, it's but they have basically they yeah. There is yeah. there. Well, right now there's actually only one of our residents is still alive. Unfortunately. Um, we lost two of the two of the people who are residents. They were actually artists in residence. Okay. So um, they had their studios and their apartments gotcha. um, in that building, and they actually lost their apartments in a different building, and then they were moved there. Um, but um, yeah, one of them was actually. Um, this is for all of the the feminists out there kate millet was one of the people who lived in that building um above us and she passed a couple years ago um so but um but actually everybody else is mostly um art offices or studios um things like that uh, but it's it's mostly either nonprofits or art and WOW itself was a space for in artists that in that building. Okay, I see. And WOW was a, was a space specifically for women, um, trans performers, and non-binary performers as like a... Yeah. Yes, so it is a collective. It's collectively run space. Um, it's um, non-hierarchically run um, and people generally just there's no artistic director so it's like you come in you do your work um you offer some work in exchange and um so it's it's basically there are no paid staff um everybody's sort of like exchanging labor so um i mean performers get paid sometimes like some people get paid sometimes but it's sort of like it's up to the producer to decide that but in terms of like people who are producing um or people who are doing other things like running lights running sound um selling tickets or i don't know cleaning taking trash out i mean there's a lot of um important work that gets done there and i think what i really to me what's really amazing about the wow is that really the person who comes in to take trash out whatever once a week and the person who is um you know writing checks to pay the bills they all have equal say 
in making decisions. So it's it's not that one one type of labor is not valued over another. Um, so mm. as long as it's keeping the space running. Um, with you valued. producing with you producing shows there, did you have any other influence on the artistic direction of of the space, or was it was hypergender your thing, and that was it? Hypergender was my thing. Um, like I said, it's sort of like every producer does their own thing. Um, every producer can make decision. Um, we have some basic guidelines, like no sexist, racist, homophobic stuff. You know, things like that cannot mm -hmm. be produced. Um, and there's a general, I would say, um, encouragement to produce work that is... Um, based in social justice movements but people can also produce things you know that are like oh i want to create um, an aesthetically pretty piece and i'm not trying to make a, a, a message or a point um i would say the only thing the only things that are cut out would be things that are clearly hateful in some way <laughs> um that go against our mission um but otherwise there's very little uh, there's very, very little control in terms of anybody telling you what you can or cannot do. Mm. Um, the only things would be safety. Like there are things that are dealing with safety. So I have infamously had um, a fire dancer <laughs> perform at which point um, while wow, decided to not allow any more people twirling fire <laughs> because... <laughs> So, you know, there are things like that. There are things that people have done that were, um, you know, maybe not so safe. And then the rule would come and say, okay, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Um, so I remember like somebody had like they were breaking glass and then it, it was putting dancers in danger because you couldn't clean it up quite as well. So then they were like, you can't really have like glass broken in a show. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are kind of limitations. Like right now we're closed because of, um, COVID-19. So that's not necessarily censorship. It's just like people oh, sure. yeah. just can't produce the shows. So venues are closed. Venues are closed. Yeah. So, so I would say there are things like that that are limiting, but not artistically. So let's jump back because you, um, came to the United States uh, at some point. Uh, so for an audience who's not familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit where you're from and your background? Yeah, so I was born in Belgrade, which was at the time Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia, and it is um, now um, the country of Serbia. And I also lived in Bosnia, um, and I lived actually just before coming to the U.S. I lived for a year in Croatia, where my uh, my maternal grandmother was from. So these are now three different countries. Um, mm -hmm. At at the time that I was born, they were all one country. You so depends. Yeah. So depends how you look at it. I might have lived in three countries before coming. <laughs> <laughs> or I did. I did legally because by the time I came here, they were already three different countries. Um, so for me, said, I... If somebody says, what's your nationality? Yeah. What What's on your passport? What does it say? Um, I have two. I have Serbian and Bosnian uh, mm -hmm. passports. I identify as Yugoslavian um, ethically. Mm -hmm. and uh, But the two... two passports that I have right now are Serbian and Bosnian. Um, I was actually about to apply for American um, citizenship when everything got shut down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, which I think I can still, I think I can apply. I don't know if they have resumed with any of that work. Um, but yeah, and then I will have three. Um, I will... I'm just gathering passports. If anybody <laughs> out there has a country, they want to like, you know invite me to be their citizen too. I would like to have um, many, many passports. I think it's really important as we can, as we can see, right? Like right now with the American passports, you can't go many places, uh -huh. but I can with mine. 
which I used to never, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to, it, it's actually, it's a, it's a form of um, both survival and privilege. It's like being able to have multiple um, citizenships. So, so uh, what was the impetus to come to the States? Um, so I was in Bosnia in the 90s. And I think depending on your audience and their age, they may remember uh, that we had a civil war in the 90s. And um, I was just getting out of in a theater there. I happened to get cast in some shows um, and um, and was actually really enjoying that work even though that was not necessarily my plan I was going to be um, an astrophysicist that was my plan in high school <laughs> I was really? gonna, um, yeah and I actually I also wanted to be an astronaut um, like I wanted to fly in Oh, hang on. We're stretching out the, we're getting the buffering again. Damn. We got as far as you're saying you wanted to be an astronaut. One second. Big sci-fi geek. So like I wanted to play. Like, Okay. Sorry, it looks like you're having another. Okay, so are we back to? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. I just, I know. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Um, so, um, is it better? I think we're, I think we're better now. So you wanted to, so uh, you're a big sci-fi geek. We'll start from that again and we'll see how okay. far we get. So I was, um, Yes. So I was, as a, as a kid, I was, I still am, I was a big sci-fi geek and I just wanted to go and fly in the space and, you know, conquer the new um, star systems. And I just had this vision of how that's all going to work. Um, I also believed that that's what's going to happen in 21st century because, again, I grew up uh, with, um, I mean, the movie came out before I was born, but I actually did see it when I was very young, The Odyssey, <laughs> 2001. Mm -hmm. And so in my vision, in 2001, that's how the world was going to be, right? Like we're going to fly on um, spaceships and travel around. So that was my plan. But since that didn't work, I thought I should go into theater. Um, it was like the next, the, next, the next best option to be in space was... <laughs> How much um, was, uh, was uh, an American influence while you were growing up? Was there a lot of local um, art and media or was it very influenced by American culture? I would say both. Um, I think there was definitely a lot of American, um, I mean, this is 80s, so we're talking like a lot of um, like American TV shows. Um, when I was younger, I definitely grew up uh, watching a lot of old American movies because um, we were socialists. So like some of the purchases of these products were like a little delayed. Um, okay. So, you know, there's so there something there was of a, a lot of, there's something of a, of a, um, a cliche of American media, yeah. like everyone getting it way late. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's different now because I think with internet, like things just get um, like almost instantaneously mm -hmm. shown um, or people can find them online. Like they don't have to wait for like um, mainstream media to purchase things. But when I was really young, like we had one channel on TV and that was like the state channel. And then I remember when the second one came, that was like more entertainment and it was fun. We had our own definitely cultural products um, that was out there. Um, I originally, when I was, when I was born in my early age, I was in Belgrade, which is a city. Um, so like my parents took me to the theater, like puppetry shows, like ballet, opera, you know, all those things. Um, 
So um, I would definitely say that I got exposed in all different kinds of cultural products, like the local, but also, um, but there were definitely like American movies and TV shows. And I would say by the time, like by the late eighties, a lot of that stuff was maybe a few months delayed mm -hmm. in terms of um, like when it's shown, but um, not, not too far in terms of when it was. Is there like a, a Belgradian Mickey Mouse or or Tom and Jerry? Like, was there it was there some is there something like that in uh, like an Eastern European kind of sense? Right. I don't know. It's kind of funny because um, like we definitely also watched like all the Disney cartoons and um, Aristocats were like my favorite cartoon because uh -huh. I love cats. I just, I, I, I adore cats. Um, I told you before we started talking here that I spent an hour just snuggling with my cat, Cha Cha, um, who is now fast asleep. Mm -hmm. I think, I think she likes to sleep. Um, I think she likes hearing voices, which makes her. The ambient noise. <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, I love when you're talking to people online. <laughs> I can just sleep. Um, so. I would say there were, we did have um, certain, um, like I mentioned, I used to go to puppetry show. There was um, a particular puppetry character that, um, and they even had like, like I had records to play like records, LPs, you know, mm -hmm. like on, um, and I would go see this character um, live, like in a, um, in a, children's theater um there were certain tv shows that were for kids that i used to love um as a child and there were a lot of them were like kids playing dress up and performing like pop songs okay. um and so they were not like cartoon characters they were actual children but they were performing um um yeah, so there were there were definitely I would say cultural products like that, but I don't know. I'm trying to think if there was ever. I feel like a lot of um, like characters came from um, different places in the world, and sometimes I'm actually not sure. I, some things I had to discover that they were actually not American, but they were from um, like France, like French cartoons or. Um, English um, you know so I think there were a lot of products that I discovered when I came here that people here didn't know about them right. but I assumed they did because they were foreign to us um, so I assumed everybody would and they were like no we never heard um, <laughs> about that I'm like oh and then I would look it up and I'm like oh I guess that was French or Italian or what so, language were you speaking at that point um, Serbo Croatian. So, okay. um, I mean, some people now call it Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, but we called it Serbo Croatian. It's, um, people often say, is it like Russian? It's, it's a Slavic language. So it resembles in a way that you could say that French and Italian and Spanish are like similar. So in mm -hmm. that same sense, we can say that, you know, our language was similar to Russian because it's like from the same family of languages. Mm. Um, but it's not where you can just like talk and understand. Like you can, you, uh, you can understand some words. There's like some, you know, I discovered, I went to Poland a few years ago for just a couple of days to Warsaw. And then I was like, Oh, I could recognize names of foods or like I could get to the restaurant and kind of look at the menu and guess what things are. Right. Um, but I couldn't really talk. Like I couldn't just have like a chat with a person. Um, <laughs> so. So you said you wanted to be uh, an astronaut and an astrophysicist. So obviously science was, key at, at, a, at a point when did you start embracing your more theatrical or show person side um i think mostly so i did some performance like i took ballet when i was a child and mostly because 
I had flat feet and my parents were told that that would help. Um, and it did. Really? So oh, it, did anybody out there, if you have a child who has flat feet, taking ballet classes that is... That bend, that curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's why... His bones are malleable. So his bones yeah, are and I was like three or something. And they. Um, that's how I started performing. Um, uh, and I did sort of like in school performances, you know, I read poetry, sang songs, um, nothing I would say super serious, but it did make me comfortable being on stage and in front of people. So like, I don't actually remember, I mean, stage fright, everybody has a certain amount of stage fright but I don't remember um, ever having like a horrible stage fright. Like performing has always been like a pleasant experience. Maybe some butterflies, but um, generally like a pleasant um, experience. So I would say, so I did some of that like emceeing, like I emceed like school stuff, <laughs> like poetry competitions. Um, in I was like, 14. So I don't know. I mean, I have performed in one way or another since I guess I was three or yeah. four. Um, but I didn't really want to do um, theater till I was um, toward the end of high school. And then somebody convinced me to audition for like my my literature teacher convinced me to go and audition for a play. Um, that was done by like a community theater type of group. Mm -hmm. um, now I didn't think I was going to get in, but I did. So, um, and then they started doing more stuff. And then I got seen by somebody in a professional theater and they invited me to um, audition and then perform in uh, like a professional theater mm -hmm. in Tuzla. Um, so I did that and I actually realized I really enjoyed it and um, but um, so I've always always I mean I guess always I have always had a very strong um, I come from a family that fought fascists in like World War Two. so I was raised on those narratives where like if you see something wrong you have to react and do something like you just don't stand there and not react and so this was during the war and I started speaking up against what I saw to be injustice and so um, I soon found out that my theater career is not really gonna stay it's just not going to pick up with me being so outspoken toward mm. people who are in power. Um, I mean, it was kind of okay when I was like a high school kid because nobody cared. Um, it was like, whatever. Um, but the higher profile you get, you become more of a target. Yeah. And then it became sort of like, because I also didn't want to participate in some productions that I thought were highly nationalist. Like I didn't want to uh, take part of that. And it just sort of, I was slowly being told like I'm not going to be um, invited back and um, and it all kind of started falling apart so I decided to um, leave um, and it was also it was wartime there were people dying there was like a lot of horrific things mm -hmm. happening so I just started feeling like I needed to get out um, and I did I actually was um, and this is often where I say, like, you know, it's kind of interesting because on one hand, it's this, um, I don't know, refugee story. On the other hand, I was um, coming from a place of privilege because my father was a doctor. So he was, he managed to get me some papers um, to get out of the country. And I'm aware that a lot of people didn't get that chance. Um, and And sometimes it's interesting to sort of think of like, that being able to escape something that horrific, it's sort of um, like having to experience that is um, not privilege, but like being able to get away with it, get away from it, um, it requires, because it required a lot of strings being pulled and mm -hmm. um, 
um, just to be able to leave the country because there was we were under military draft and so everybody was um, everybody was actually under under draft so uh, can, you explain you what were, that means? can you explain what that means for yeah so you know it, there was sort of like basically um, so I I didn't mention it beginning so I identify as non-binary I was assigned female at birth um, so even though generally people who are assigned female at birth normally would not have been drafted in the military um, because it was wartime. There was like uh, a need, I guess. Yeah. So it was, and then a lot of the times it depended, like you might have been put to, um, to do something. I refused. I actually refused the draft. I took the draft letter, returned it and said, I refuse to participate in this war. Um, and I walked away before anybody grabbed me. <laughs> so I think everybody was in so much shock. Um, but I felt like I felt that it, I did not want to participate. And um, I think it's it's when we find ourselves in those situations, it's um, it's a choice everybody has to make for themselves. Um, what they think is. Um, what what they think they should do and i yeah. i felt like i needed to leave and um so i left um and i mean it's interesting because i did like i said i worked in a theater we actually performed at some times for like military like there were certain things that i was like okay i'm willing to do that but like i will not take a gun and fight like i will not um um so anyway so we um I made it to Croatia that I stayed there for a year. I actually took some acting classes uh, with the little money I had, which was almost nothing. Um, but I, um, I auditioned for their theater academy and um, was turned down. Um, I experienced um, at the audition that I was asked questions like, why was I there? I was, um, not without going into too many too much detail of the the war in the Balkans I was not the right ethnicity at the right place I mean and I know this happened to a lot of people in different places um, who had their own um, you know I come from a mixed uh, background so I didn't really fit anywhere mm -hmm. Um, so I found out that I can come apply to come to college here to the US and I applied and uh, through World University Service and I got in um, and I ended up in Washington State um, so I went from my undergrad I was in Washington State um, where I studied theater and psychology and math <laughs> i mean so, yeah so, is that was that as as your way of keeping your options open <laughs> in terms of yeah, what you may end up well in? i right i got my um original uh scholarship to study psychology right. because in order to get it you needed to show that you're going to do something that's going to be useful for your um country mm -hmm. and theater there was like i think three things that were listed that you could not get this scholarship for and one was i think it was like medical school which i don't understand why mm -hmm. but i know there was like one that was like nuclear physics or something like that it was like something and then the third one was theater like you could not like you could study other arts like right you could minor but you couldn't have that be your so you could well you could the the thing that i couldn't understand i was like so i could be music major but i can't be theater major like that doesn't like why is theater excluded but like other arts anyway but it was seen as like frivolous like you yeah. like they don't want to pay for you to come here to do that so i did um i actually then found out once i got here that i could do both i could do um I could do theater as long as I get a degree in like psychology, I could also get a degree in theater. So mm. 
I did. I was like, fine, then I'll do two. Um, and then I got math minor because I just like math. Hmm. There was no, there was, no understanding was like, of, of, of loving math myself. Yeah, I <laughs> I'm mean, glad I'd there really... are people out there who do because they can do it. Yeah, but I... yeah no, I, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so that was that was it. And, and then I, I applied for grad school. And it was all to kind of stay in the country. And I mean, I did want to get further education, but it was also to stay in the country. And, um, and then I won a green card lottery. I won the diversity lottery hmm. uh, visa. And that's how I got my, that's how I got to stay. <laughs> mm-hmm. You um, learn English in Croatia or in Serbia or did you learn it? Yeah, I started learning English when, well, we, we started learning it in school in the third grade and um, I started learning it. My parents knew, I mean, knew English as a second language. So they started teaching me when I was like little. Hmm. Um, because they were students, they couldn't afford to put, they could not afford to pay me for me to go to like take English classes when mm-hmm. I was like three or four. So they decided they were just going to like teach me themselves. Um, so I started learning English when I was very young. Um, and I had it like officially in school for nine years. Nine years, yes, before coming here. Um, I definitely, I wouldn't say that I was fluent in a way, you know, I mean, I could, I could study, but I definitely had to learn a lot more. Um, Because also I would say a lot of my English was not, like it wasn't, I mean, I did watch, like I would try to watch movies. I tried reading some books before coming here, um, short stories. I remember reading Edgar Allan Poe's short stories as <laughs> to like practice my English. Um, That's so gone. And I love it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I think I went to like, there was like an American center or something like cultural center and uh-huh. they had like free paperbacks. They were letting people pick up. Um, and so I looked and I think there was like a lot of like romances, which I didn't want to read. And then there was like short stories by Edgar Allan Poe. And I'm like, okay. There you go. I'll take that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. But I remember also going to my first year here. I went to a supermarket, and I was trying to write down all the names of the produce because I realized I had no idea, like some of that very very basic language. Sure. Yeah. That yeah, they just don't teach you in school, right? Like the cantaloupe. I remember cantaloupe. I was like, oh my god. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so I would just go around the supermarket with like a little notepad and I would like write down, um, like look at the names of the produce that mm-hmm. were like written and then um, try to learn. <laughs> I feel like, um, I mean, obviously I think culturally uh, we're starting in education to teach children additional languages earlier than we have necessarily in the past. We're still really reticent to it because we're, again, we, I mean, you went from one nationalist to another, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. But, um, and we're very, we're very uh, English centric right now to like a, a yeah. frustrating degree of, of a, it's not, I don't even know, if it's, it's not even classist per se. It's just, but they, it's, I guess it's associated with it. Um, in terms of, well, it's- yeah. Yeah. No, it's just very strange because I think I don't know like here it's like almost it's like everywhere else in the world if you're bilingual or trilingual like that's seen as a, like, yeah. a good thing and it's yeah. actually a sign of education, right? Like it's a sign of like having like learning more and it's like a good and often children learn very young and mm-hmm. in a lot of countries children grow up speaking several languages and um, Here so, too, they're just not in the socioeconomic yeah to make so, it look like a good thing for right. like it yeah.
Do you like movies? Any movies. Old movies, new movies. Bad movies. Sad movies. I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And I'm Rachel Corky Shank. And together we host Screen Snark, a movie podcast for movie lovers by movie lovers. It's a podcast dedicated to the movies that are in our eyes, on our minds, and in our hearts. Featuring guests of a wide selection of entertainment backgrounds, performers, writers, creatives. So please join us for the casual cinema conversation every other Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. And follow us on Twitter at screen underscore snark, and we'll, we'll see, see you at, at the movies. movies. All right, we're supposed to do that bit together. It's cool. PonyPod, a traveling performers podcast. If you like hearing from traveling performers, please subscribe and leave five stars wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm your host, Miss Mary Jane Green, the Trouser Tent Teaser. You can find me on the main social media platforms or by joining my mailing list at MissMaryJaneGreen.com. In the immortal words of Jack Kerouac, nothing behind me. Everything ahead of me, as is ever so, on the road. What were some of the uh, most immediate differences coming to the United States that were different from where you had been? Besides the fact that, you know, our wars were somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I actually have to say, like, some of... There were good things, bad things, funny Mm -hmm. things. Um, I... um, well, one of the things was, so like I mentioned, I got this um, scholarship to go to a, a school in Washington. And mm-hmm. the way they told me was that this was near Seattle. Um, it was 100 miles from Seattle. <laughs> so where I'm from, that's like another country. Uh-huh. Right? 100 miles is like... Like, if you drive for 100 miles, you literally end up in a different country. Um, and I mean, I'm exaggerating, like, you know, maybe 200 miles, but mm-hmm. whatever. The point is that it's lot, really yeah. far. <laughs> um, so I got picked up at the airport and they were driving and driving and driving and driving. And this is like the family. Um, I was lucky, this really lovely um, family of um, retired educators. Um, they basically... Um, there's there's an organization. It's called Fellowship of Reconciliation that started during the World War One, and they generally have different programs for different wars around the country um, and uh, country around the world. And well, the way it's going here, it's going to be around the country. But anyway, so <laughs> around the world, and so for Bosnia, they had a program to help students um, get scholarships to come to the U.S. and um, um, just get education and um, and they would pair you with families that are volunteering with that organization and then the family would help you um, often they will provide housing for you um, or find you housing um, and then the university would give you money for tuition um, they would give you a scholarship so it was like a program and so this family they picked me up they were driving me home they're driving me to where I was going to stay and um, you know after like I think we were going for like 40 minutes or something and I was just like are we there yet like you said it's near Seattle like we've been in this car for a really long time and they were like oh yeah it's like another half an hour or so I'm like we have been already driving forever (laughs) um so that was first shock is this sense of distance um, and especially, and you're in California, so you're on the West Coast, like there's this sense yeah. of space and distance that I yeah. think is not in New York so much. Like New York not is at much all. more like- You're all, all on yes. top of each other and we're all, yeah. we're all split was, up, yeah. So, you know, it's like I lived for a while, which was like eight miles from the university and I had to drive. And that just was, um, you know, the fact that I had to drive to school every day was like, to me, just crazy. Like- Did you drive, um, you drove- in, I learned to drive. Yeah. No, I actually learned to drive here. I had to learn to drive because 
Um, when you live in a small town in America, right, you have to learn to drive. Um, there's no other way around it. Um, which to them was so strange that I was like 19, almost 20, and I could drive. Like they were like, what do you mean you can't drive at 20? And I was like, I don't know. I just, you know, I mean, I have friends back home who learned to drive a few years ago right and like mm -hmm. i'm 45 i don't mind sharing with the audience but the I, you know i have friends who like literally learned to drive in the last few years and i have friends who never learned who are you know who just there's no point you live in a city you know why bother you can take uh public transportation everywhere so um so that was change and then um they were so this is the school didn't start yet so a lot of things were not happening it's a small school town which again people who are in who went to small school towns this may sound familiar but there's like a college and then there's like a few bars and restaurants like a couple of supermarkets and then the rest of it was farms mm. um, in Washington it was like farmland um, a lot of cows and um, a lot of deer just coming in putting their head through a car window like all new things for me it, for me it wasn't just that it was america it was also like i came from a city into a rural area so it was yeah. like one issue was that it was a different country different language uh, everything is different but then it was also like the lifestyle was like so different <laughs> I think it's funny because um, so many times I think uh, Americans would assume it would be the inverse, that you would come uh, from like, I don't know, like a Slavic farmland and that right. you would come into the city and that it would be the opposite. So it's, it's right. funny that you had the exact opposite experience. Yeah. And so I remember being like, okay, so where do we go clubbing? And they're like, clubbing. And I'm like, yeah, clubbing. Like, what else do you do for fun? Because that was, you know, my concept of fun was like, that's what you do yeah. you go dancing um <laughs> and um and they're like oh we can go for ice cream and i was like ice cream i'm 20 like you want to go for ice cream and they're like you can't get into bars you're not 21 i'm like what do you mean i can't get into a bar and it really took, it was so shocking i was like i have been living on my own supporting myself um, at that point for like quite a while, mm -hmm. I thought of myself as an adult person, um, you know, young adult, but like adult, right? Like somebody who's taking care of themselves, paying their own rent, like doing all these things. And I'm like, I can't go get a beer. Like that is insane. And for me, it wasn't even drinking. I was like, okay, can I just go and not drink? Like, I don't have to get a drink. Like I'll just have a coffee or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so two things I discovered. One is that there's really no good coffee in bars here. You're saying that, uh, that close to Seattle too. <laughs> yeah. That's why I actually I have to say as much as everybody hates in Starbucks, I, I have this, like, there's like a soft stop spot I have for Starbucks because that was like the first, like the first place where I could actually sit down and have like an espresso. <laughs> so because they opened um, this is again, this is like 90s. So they just started spreading from Seattle and they just opened um, when they opened in this small town like a Starbucks. It was, I was so happy. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think Starbucks in like New York City is not a good thing, but I feel like Starbucks is only small towns. It's like, <laughs> it's the only place. Um, so anyway, but I discovered you can't get, um, you cannot go in a bar and order an espresso, mm -hmm. um, which back home, it's actually very normal. Most bars have both alcohol and like coffee houses. They're usually mm -hmm. like merged. Um, so people will go in the afternoon and have coffee and then at the same place will go in the evening and maybe have a drink. And it's like not, uh, and you can have a table where like, some people are having coffee and some people are having beer and like it's um it's a very different concept from like bars here but yeah i found out i cannot go in i cannot enter a bar even if i'm just gonna drink like a uh, seltzer mm -hmm. um so yeah oh mm -hmm. and so that was the big 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 thing um there was a funny thing where because 
I like sour cream. Well, I'm vegan now, so I don't really eat it anymore. But I used to put sour cream in everything. Like, I would just add it to random things. Um, like to green beans, you just put some sour cream on top of green beans, you know. And um, so I stayed in the beginning. I stayed with different families, and they told the next family that I just love sour cream. So they were like giving them some tips about me. So I get there, and I think they gave me something like um, I don't know whatever they were making, like uh, let's say pancakes, right? And they're like, "Do you want some sour cream?" And I was just like, "What?" so they're like they told us you eat sour cream with everything um so there were things like that they also warned the first family i stayed with they warned them that people coming from work can have ptsd and they can be suicidal so the family i was which is real that's like a real you know it's a real thing but i also really like to sleep in so I think it was like a weekend. I had no friends. I didn't really, what was I going to do? I was just going to, like, this is like first few months. Um, so I was sleeping and I think it was like two in the afternoon or something. And I realized somebody keeps coming into the room and like poking her head out and then leaving. So finally I was just like, what is going on? And apparently they were really afraid. I wasn't coming out and it was like midday and they thought, they were afraid I killed myself and I was just like oh my god so I had to sit them down and I was just like okay I am depressed and I'm dealing with whatever my trauma and like all this stuff mm-hmm. but I'm not planning to like, <laughs> just because I'm sleeping in um at least so, they were concerned at least they had, uh-huh. they, had some. <laughs> they were they were and I'm glad we actually talked because like for a while I think they were they just didn't know and like they were told all these things to prepare them and then um I didn't know why they're being all like you know, weird. (laughs) So, um, yeah. Oh, and they took me to rodeo. That was also like another big cultural shock. Um, so there were certain things I had no idea, um, Mm -hmm. were like real. And one of them was rodeo. I thought it was just, I thought it was kind of like, um, well, you know, like back in the days, um, you know, we had people do certain full key things, like wear certain kinds of clothes. They used to have these like village dances where they would go, but you know, we're talking like hundred years ago or more. <clears throat> and I thought that was like that, like, like rodeo was something that people used to do mm-hmm. back in the days, but it did not occur to me that anybody did that now. And so they took me to see the rodeo and like rodeo grandmas and little kids like riding sheep I guess anyway I just remember like being completely in shock I was just like what is this like this so yeah so I would say there were there were definitely a lot of cultural shocks um I would say another big shock for me was um which I don't know why that was a shock to me, but it was a shock to me was just how much racism is there in America. Yeah. Um, I think that was another thing that I, like we learned in school about uh, slavery. We learned about civil rights movement. Like we learned about some key parts of American history in a way you learn about other countries. Um, mm-hmm. So it wasn't, um, but I think we kind of stopped like American history somewhere in like Vietnam was like the ending point. Like we didn't really talk about anything after. Um, and so I remember coming and, um, and re- I was coming out of our own civil like war conflict, our own sort of like ethnic hatred, like people hating each other fighting. So I was feeling very sensitive to any kind of, um, <sighs> bigotry? Would, bigotry right like there was just like i really had this like high heightened sensitivity to that because i just lived through people like yeah. killing each other and and um, you can see what it can come to that's the <sighs> thing yeah. yeah and so um i remember coming um with a friend to have lunch in um in a cafeteria and um and she's black and like we were walking in and and I realizing with her as we walked in that the cafeteria was segregated. It was like 
and this is like 95, 96. And like, I mean, it wasn't segregated by law, but it was but just it like visually, was. right? It was like, um, and I remember looking at her and I was just like, so what are we supposed to do? Like, I don't, uh, you know, and then she was like, well, we're just going to go and sit over um, with um, the rest of sort of like the, the, the side of the cafeteria that was like uh, black people, international people kind of like, she's like, I think that's probably like a better for us. Um, but there was a lot of things like that, that I remember coming here and just being really um shocked that that's like still because i think the way it was taught like i i think the way we learned about it was like there were all these horrific things um but it was kind of like you know like you learn about things like slavery and like the way you would learn about like world war ii and like you you don't expect to go um to um i don't know like i guess in the same way that you would expect going to other countries and like it's their history but right. they don't think it's cur- you thought we've got over all that yeah and yeah. and i think got over in a way that i thought that that was just like understood by everybody just how bad all that mm-hmm. was like and and that's the part that i think i never like it took me years to understand actually how much it was not dealt with in this country like how much um there was no kind of reckoning like there was like I think what's happening maybe now, hopefully, um, where like there's more conversation. And I think I just assumed these conversations were had in like 70s or 60s or 50s, you know, like. No, I, I don't uh, know why per se, other than just, you know, pigheadedness, but America is very um, fractured and, and we're very stuck in our, in our individuality of, uh, Southern states, Northern states, um, Western, uh, the, the, the coasts. And then we just sort of don't want to deal with, um, you know, the others. And I think that that's inc- incredibly clear how we handle re- refugees and immigrants as well, is that it just, it flies in the face of our normalcy and it, it bothers us. And that's also why a lot of folk have uh, issues with, um sexual and gender differences like any any just upfront difference yeah. really yeah bothered. i think that's that's like another that's like another one that was like the queerness i so i came from a place where actually it really was on one hand it was i would there was um like liberal when it comes to sexuality but on the other hand like queerness really wasn't um discussed Mm-hmm. I mean, so much of that was just kind of like hush hush, like don't talk about it. Um, it we have our own rise in homophobia actually in the '90s, like which becomes much more homophobic than in like '80s. Like with nationalism, the homophobia came up. Um, mm. But here, I think I thought because it just seemed to me so much more liberal. Like I just assumed. Um, it was fine, right? So, like, I was just, like, coming out left and right because I'm yeah. like, oh, you know. This is who I am, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's not illegal. I can say it. Nobody's going to, like, you know, like, I can just say it out loud. And it's, like, and so I think some of that also caught me by surprise that, like, there were people who were homophobic because I think I – didn't even realize because like I never really talked about it at home and then I would tell some of my friends and they didn't really seem to have any reaction Mm -hmm. um which they told me later when we talked when I asked them years later I was like well I told you when I was 16 I really think that whatever um girl is hot and I want to like have sex with her and you never said anything they were like well you were always saying shit that was crazy it's like you nobody ever like (laughs) Like, nobody got surprised by anything you said. Like, you were just, you know. Um, and so, yeah. So, I don't think I ran into... I mean, I did run back home into homophobia later, which is ironic, but, like, not before. Then I ran to that. a lot of people here who were, like... I remember doing my first 
class. I had to take some kind of intro to English class um, to improve my English. And I, I did a, a presentation on um, like why should gay marriage be legalized, which was like, again, like 90s. And to me, that just seemed like perfectly reasonable. Um, and then I remember some people in the class like objecting and I was looking at them. I'm like, what? Like, I didn't expect, I thought it was, you know, <laughs> it was like certain... the opportunity to, uh, to argue for it. That yeah. means that people weren't for it. <laughs> yeah. But I guess I didn't really, I think I thought it was like, I didn't expect anybody in college. Like I was like, I, in my head, the people who were against were like these uneducated people somewhere. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so there were interesting um, things like, or like health insurance. Like I remember talking to people that not understanding that there's no universal health insurance. Like that was very strange to me. Um, again, coming from a place where like, that was just guaranteed, like mm -hmm. everybody had health insurance. It wasn't even a question. Like, it's just like a basic human right. Like, like you have right to breathe air. Like, I don't know, like, um, and so, um, and then talking to people here who were not necessarily um, conservative, who just could not understand the concept of like, universal health insurance like mm -hmm. it just I mean and that conversation is now but like we're talking now like 25 years later like I feel like finally maybe in the last like decade it's become more of like more and more people kind of getting mm -hmm. on board but yeah it, well because things can only last so far spinning out of control yeah <laughs> when did you so, finally make your way to New York um in 2000 i i graduated undergrad and i i knew i wanted to move uh to new york um i really could not do any more small towns um and so i got into a mfa program at stony brook in long island mm -hmm. um and they offered to pay for me to go to school so i went there um i also had an offer to go to a school in um, Virginia and I was just like I can't <laughs> no offense to you know Virginia but I was like I need I need to be in like somewhere near New York <laughs> mm -hmm. so I wasn't I was in Stony Brook which is like 50 miles I think from here but at least it was like a train ride like I could just right. hop on a train and be here I mean, that's sort of the same of going from borough to borough, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and then I moved to the city in 2003. Um, okay. To Astoria, where I am. Yeah. yeah. How quickly did you start? I mean, I could probably do the math, but how quickly did you get into burlesque? I actually started, um, so I started performing before coming to New York, before moving, so like 2002-ish, and I was just, I don't even know, like, at that time, like, it wasn't, like, burlesque wasn't that separate in its own, like, people were doing things that mm -hmm. were um, burlesque, but they were, like, there was only really a handful of shows that were, like, burlesque shows, but there was a lot of random queer shows doing random yeah, I've talked to Tigger about it. Like the Dylan, the the deciding yeah. to market it like that came later. Like yeah. it was just folk came together and and just right. Did. So like it was definitely. I mean, like there were shows that were, and actually Tigger was like one of the. There was like a show that he was in, and um, Miss Astrid was hosting, and. Um, dirty martini and like they were doing and I remember I tell Tigger all the time I'm like here's the reason why I started doing burlesque because a lot of stuff that I saw was more kind of femme um and then I thought I saw him actually I think he was doing his father figure or his <laughs> uh, father Tigger um act and I was like oh my god I want to be this when I grow up um so 
Yeah, so I tell Tigger it's his it's his fault I ended up in burlesque. I think that, um, you take that as one of the greatest compliments. Because <laughs> I was definitely coming from like a more um, theater and like I was into like acting and directing and like um, I did work with another performer. His name was um, the Alligator Boy, and we came together. And he was a performance artist. Um, um, he passed a few years ago, so but he was ex- extremely talented. And like we did, we had some acts together that they really are not. I mean, they're performance art, but a lot of like a lot of the times we would get booked in. Um, these kind of, I don't know, they really were like variety shows. They were not, not really burlesque. They were just like a drag and, and burlesque and, and performance art and all this stuff. So we did stuff <clears throat> together and then he left uh, New York and then I started looking. And then I think when I started looking on my own, I realized that I had better chance of getting booked in um, burlesque shows than necessarily in the shows that were mostly run by gay men. Um, there was, um, there is, um, I mean, I want to hope that now it's less division, but there's like often this kind of division. Um, and like the two of us, because we were, um, we could fit in different categories. Like we got booked for like lesbian parties Mm -hmm. and we got booked for like shows that were done by gay men. And it was like we, any kind of queer shows because like we could appeal to like variety of, um, but I realized when he left that I kind of um, started bumping into some walls and I was just like, well, what if I try doing some burlesque? And then I slipped into that. So so I would say I was Jay-Z bitch before I did burlesque. Um, and I, Jay-Z bitch actually started writing, and it's that the alligator boy, my uh, performance partner, he's the one who named me, who named me bitch. So I was Jay-Z because um, of my, uh, my legal name. Um, and then my nickname was like Jazz and then uh, Jazzy and then Jay-Z. Uh, but then he was always saying that I'm a bitch and he would be like, you're such a bitch. And then so I was like, but I needed a name. I was like, well, Jay-Z bitch. <laughs> um, but without the T. So do you often t- have people who, who question how to pronounce it? Cause I think yeah. I, originally I was like, is it Bic? I don't no, want to, I don't want to say bitch if it's wrong. Like that's the right. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know I do. I do run into that like beach and, um, yeah, well, I was writing a column for a school newspaper that was called Stony Love, uh, or Stony Brook, so it was like a love column. This is also like early 2000s, there were all these like sex columns, love columns, you know, like, yeah, right, and so like we were, I was writing like a sex column for the school newspaper, um, and um, it was meant to be like tongue in a cheek, and I actually think I didn't necessarily want I didn't want that right author to be like gendered particularly Mm. like I wanted it to be this kind of and I needed a name because I didn't want people to know that it's me writing it um I mean my friends knew but like I didn't want everybody to know uh, because some of that stuff was like really explicit (laughs) like (laughs) um anyway so um so yeah, so I needed a name and but they couldn't they would not spell bitch in the paper like B I T C H. So that I was, was like way of. <laughs> So yeah, so I was like fine, it's bitch without a T. <laughs> so um and then it just stuck. And I mean that was still like I mean it's still sort of like can be an issue like if you're trying to get into like official you know, if you're trying to get listed in certain places like they were just like would not spell uh. the word it's not it's not corporate friendly right so <laughs> but yeah so what were um, what were the some of the uh sort of as we come to to uh hypergender uh what were some of the first years of that like and why and what did it mean to you to put yeah that so i was i actually produced few shows before like there was a I had a group of us who were called the barbarians 
and um kind of like this is like bush era so like we were like the barbarians taking down the empire um that was our <laughs> and it was like a lot of stuff we did was very political um and very much like anti-war and like anti-bush um and and then that group kind of fell apart um and um i I'm trying to think. So I was kind of on my own for a while. And then um, it was actually me and Crimson Kitty were going to um, Boston for the Burlesque Expo, or we were coming back from Boston driving. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about how there are no, at the time, there were really no queer shows in New York. And um, and like I said, there were things like before, like I feel like when I just came to New York, there were these shows that were queer and then there was like, and then there was suddenly Wait, like, no, nah. yeah. 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 And we were like, well, like there are no queer shows. And like, I was told um, by some people and I'm not, this is not to call anybody out. So I'm not calling out any names, but like I've been told by like, like it's too, like, stuff that I'm doing like it's too queer like it's too explicit like I was often told like I can't like Jay-Z bitch does a lot of acts with a dildo like with my mm -hmm. glittery dildos that are handmade and I would be told like you can't and like the same venues that would allow um that would allow cis male performers to have their penises out would be the same places telling me that I can't have a dildo and I was just like mm -hmm. you're not even making any sense like mm -hmm how is this like <laughs> i mean like there are nudity laws and bars that tell you you can be like naked but i don't know if any law is saying you cannot have a dildo like there's no like <laughs> that's dipped in glitter yeah. it's not even like it's an art piece yeah I'm like it's not even like realistic looking it's um so yeah and so we're like you know what we want to do we want to be where we're, like nobody can tell us what we can and cannot do and we want to have a show where like uh nobody's censoring anybody's queerness or bodies I, that was really important for us to have a space where there's no um like you didn't you don't have to have the uh, the whatever normative body that's like below a certain size or like um, so it was very important for us to create that space mm -hmm. for queer people, for uh, performers of different body shapes, people with um, people of different races and ethnicities, because also that's another thing that at the time, so we're talking like 2007, mm -hmm. um, that we realized that a lot of shows at the time um, were even if even if producers were not necessarily straight but they're like there was this this narrative of like a white straight straight thin cis female body that was mm -hmm. like and this is not like there were definitely people who were in the scene at the time who were not mit fitting that norm but like there was sure. really not that many shows that were welcoming um and so we were like well we want to like really consciously create a space where not just that we're like welcoming everybody but it's also like we are going to try to invite these performers that we have seen um and encourage them to do stuff um and so that was always like part of our mission <clears throat> and at some point i don't remember what year i think it might have been like 2009 or 10 where crimson sort of took off to do her own stuff that sounds about right because i came in about 2008 2009 to do my first performance with y'all. Yeah. yeah, she was, she, they were still was there, still there. Right? Yeah. So they were still Actually, there. Uh, sorry, they, they, I had met uh, a Before, few months right? earlier at yeah. the Lovely Rays show. Uh-huh. I met both of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did the Love Me Dead duet. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. Um, and when the two of you said that you had a show that I yeah. was invited to. That ha that happened yeah. shortly thereafter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so anyway, so we started creating um uh, and then um I 
kind of continued um, doing stuff on my own. I had different um, co-producers coming in and out. Um, so there was um, Eddie, Mercedes Matilda, um, Eddie or Jean, Jean Magin. And <clears throat> um, uh, Bunny, Bunny Knows Best, Kind of Limb. Um, there was definitely, um, there were people who were co-producing. Mm -hmm. The um, core, like the core family. Yeah. Well, sort of like, like I stayed throughout the 11 years, but there was like, I never really wanted to do it. And you've produced the show. Like I never wanted to do it alone. I was just like, I cannot, like it's too much work. <laughs> um, I need a team. <laughs> Um, so like, you know, kind of limb who doesn't really perform, um, much, but like she did our like emailing and like getting people's music and like, she did a lot of, um, like promotions, like all of that. Like she did a lot of that work that I was just like, oh my God, you know, like you need the person who's doing that. So I mean, you get a theater company, there are different roles and different jobs. I mean, there are some people who can slip in and out yeah. of all of them, but it takes the note. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, like, definitely, um, but I think by the time we were, so we wrapped up 18, I think it was, like, 2018, and then we actually did one more show in 19 for Pride. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan was to do just the annual Pride show. Um, this year, we didn't do it because, well, Everything. because. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and I really did not feel in June, like, doing... Um, I mean, well, I'm like, in June. I mean, with like, we did think of doing maybe like online show, but then with the protests happening, actually, um, really the people I would want to like work with, a lot of us were like out protesting. It was just like, this is really not like mm -hmm. the world will live without us having a pride show. Um, and actually, while WoW, WoW had a pride show instead, well, not instead, but um, because we were for years like WoW's pride show. And then, mm -hmm. Uh, WoW had a uh, Pride Online um, event with like all the different people from WoW. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it, it, I think by the time we wrapped up, it felt like there were a lot of shows out there that were doing, um, not necessarily what we were doing, but sort of like that grew out that started, that were booking, mm -hmm. um, a lot of different people that were definitely queer and so I was like well you know I'm ready to kind of do something else and not um, like I didn't feel like I was doing it justice anymore I was getting tired I didn't feel like I had energy uh, to produce every month and I was just like I need time off um, but it actually wasn't it didn't feel um, it didn't actually feel like a sad thing or a bad thing it felt like um, like it's good. Like it's good. Like we had, we ran a yeah. Like we mm -hmm. ran a good show. We yeah. we wanted to create that space. I feel like we did um, create that space. I know we encouraged a lot of people. Came out. Um, um, you know, like um, Essence Reveal mm -hmm. was like we were one of the first shows that she was working with. Um, oh, I met her. Yeah. yeah actually, so, your show is Hypercenter is one of the is is that is the show. Of, of a couple shows uh, where I would always meet someone or several yeah. someones per show that I would yeah. then end up yeah. either booking or yeah. seeing again and then creating friendships with. So yeah. extraordinarily, uh, uh, I don't want to say seminal show. But it, was, <laughs> it was a... <laughs> No, and I I think that's like I I do like I feel good about that. Like I feel like that was kind of the mission what we wanted to do, and I'm like you know. Um, it didn't, it didn't like it feel, it feel like it filled that hole mm -hmm. and then things grew. Right. And mm -hmm. not like there were, there were, by the way, a lot of other people who helped, um, not us, but like who helped the scene get more, um, you know, there were a lot of other, other performers, other producers yeah. who kind of worked on that, creating that kind of openness. So I'm not like. We are no, the but ones. you're. But I mean, uh, I, it takes um, uh, a lot of folk and a lot of places because 
you can have one venue or one producer who's doing great things, but the more normal that becomes, yeah. I think that's, yeah. that's really great because then it gives more opportunities. People who couldn't come to WOW because it was an alphabet yeah. city, but could go to Brooklyn because that person was influenced yeah. by her. Uh, yeah. I think it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think definitely I would say that was, you know, that was the idea. And that's why I felt like really happy every time we would hear about another mm -hmm. um, queer show starting somewhere or um, and and creating that new space. And I remember people were like, oh, you know, like, well, you're not the only one anymore. And I'm like, we never wanted to be the only one. Like, you know, like, actually, that's too much pressure. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't, you know, I want to be able to quit. Like, I don't. And go to others and go to shows too. Like and also. go to shows and also like not feel like irresponsible for, you know, here's Chacha. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to feel responsible for like keeping the, the whatever queer blessing you know, allow. Exactly. Like I want to be able to like retire. You know? <laughs> um, you feel that you've, you've more or less retired? Um, I am. I mean, I feel like it's, um, I, I actually, that was another thing. Like, I feel like if I, if I had an idea, I lo I stopped having ideas for acts. Mm. That's to be honest. Like, um, I, um, I did that. That might have been the last. I wonder if that's the last act I created. The um, Bohemian Rhapsody. It was sort of like this weird. Like, I felt like I poured everything into it, and then. Um, and so I feel that if you, I feel like if you feel you have to force yourself to create, then maybe there is nothing you want to say. Like, you know, maybe, maybe you said what you had to say. Um, and there's, it's okay. You know, like, it's okay. Like it's not. Um, and it also doesn't mean that like, you're never gonna have anything right. to say. Like, I, you know, I may wake up in, like, five years, so I'm like, I had this brilliant idea for this act, and I'm gonna make it, and then, um, and then I'll make everybody book it. <laughs> exactly. So, well, that's the thing, is you have but, all this history, you make all the connections, yeah. you make all, and you create this, uh, but, this you know, connection, and then you can right. come back anytime. <laughs> but on the other hand, I feel like if I don't feel that, like if I'm sitting here going like I must come up with something and like I must come up with something, then it's like why, right? Like we all know we're not getting paid for this enough to like have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, and some of the things like I started, um, I started um because like I said, like I came from theater and part of that is they also stopped. Um, I stopped writing um, because I felt like I was pouring all this creative energy elsewhere. And then I was like, but maybe I do want to go back to um, writing. And I did since like I directed, um, <clears throat> I did um, a show that I directed. I still work with antisocial um you know, we create some videos. We've, I've worked on this play called Resilience with a team of people. Um, so I, I don't feel like I'm not creatively doing things. It's just different. Different. Um, and so that was the part that I felt like I, I wasn't, I didn't have time to focus on theater work because I was constantly producing so like I couldn't really rehearse like I was really um so yeah but like I said like I feel like you know you never I mean I, it's kind of like the way I used to write poetry and then I stopped writing poetry and then suddenly I woke up and I wrote a poem and it's, it's like you know I feel like there's things that um if it comes to me it comes to me so mm. yeah before. So that's why I'm like, I'm semi-retired. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like one of those things. It's like, it's, it's especially in this time of, of our culture where we're, we're stuck in a pandemic. Like, what is the present tense? Are, if mm -hmm. you're not actively writing something, does that mean you stopped being a writer? No, we still call you a writer yeah. if you're not physically holding a pen. Well, and yeah, I agree. And that's also like another thing. I'm like, I don't, I really don't. Um, I don't mind video as a form. I don't want to do burlesque on a video. 
Um, I think there are people who do it who are really amazing at doing it. Um, I feel like if I'm going to work on a video, I want to work on like a short film. Like, you know, it's sort of like not to say that I can't work on <clears throat> um, on something with what we have right now, being stuck mostly at home. <clears throat> but it's... Um, yeah, I don't, to me, I like, I don't feel like it trusted. That's why I also feel like once we are back open and like performing, um, I may feel like there's something to create. Right. Um, but right now I want to think of what is it that I want to create in this, um, with what's available. Right. So. Yeah, we have no idea what we're going to do because we're, we're constantly in a state of processing. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I've definitely like, I've been writing more like short stuff. Um, <clears throat> nothing, nothing yet worth sharing, but I have definitely been doing more of that, which I feel like, you know, it's easier to do if you're home stuck with a computer writing is like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank you for, for spending so much time with me today and telling me your history. I look forward to what the future holds. And again, I, I thank you uh, for being so formative. And White Elephant at Rock Bar, we did uh, a five-year residency that I have to say had a connection due to what I learned yeah. through working with you and working with a lot of really fabulous folk. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, I was so excited when um, that was happening. It was an incredible yeah. show. I'm going to let you have the rest of your evening. I'm going to begin my evening because we're three hours. <laughs> um, All right. You're yeah. seven. Oh my God. Yes. My jazz um, band already ended. They ended 10. <laughs> and Chanta here, you, this is her telling me I need to go to bed. This I feel, like, I understand. Man, my cat was, was jumping around. I think he bothered the husband instead. But yeah. um, thank you for, for everything. So, um, it was good seeing you. Love you seeing you. Thank you so much. Bananarama? Okay. Okay, all I, right. A band? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. As a pastor's kid growing up in the 90s, there was a lot of mainstream entertainment that I was sheltered from. Stephen Root, he does one of the voices. Okay. You know him from news radio. Do I? You know him from office space. Do I? You know... <laughs> uh, most things, really. So, now that I am an independent and out queer 30-something, I'm finally asking my friends to teach me about all the stuff I missed out on. Wait, Raffi did Beatles covers? Yes, he did. My mind is blown. <laughs> he did Octopus's Garden. And, um... Yeah, I remember Octopus's yeah, Garden. No. I didn't know that that wasn't a Raffi original <laughs> until just now. The re-education of Hazel Tarts. Subscribe now. Kevin Costner. He was so foxy. You... I know the name, I don't know the face. I cannot... What is Kevin Costner? Can you just show me a picture of Kevin Costner's no, face, please? think of the guy... This is hurting Not Cheech Marin, but think of the other guy in Tin Cup. I've never seen that.